let's kick it off, Matt. Jesus Christ is born. Jesus Christ is born. Let all of heaven and earth rejoice on this Christmas morn. Jesus Christ is born. attention to the screens for some announcements. Good morning, Journey, and Merry Christmas to you all. It's time for some quick announcements. Christmas Eve is only two weeks away. Yep, it's on a Sunday this year, and we are so excited for our extra special Christmas Eve services. Both of our services will be happening at the usual times of 9 and 1045 a.m., but they're going to look a little different. We'd love for all the kids to come to church dressed in their pajamas. They'll be teaching us a fun new song they've been learning at the beginning of the service, and then they'll head back to enjoy a Christmas celebration in the kids' area. In big church, we'll serve hot cocoa in addition to our normal coffees and come together for a beautiful time of worship and candlelight to honor our Savior's birth. It's going to be so special, and we don't want anyone to miss it. Take this opportunity to invite some friends and family or folks who may not yet have a church home and let them know they're always welcome here at Journey. To the parents and family of Journey Kids and Bridge Kids, please make sure to pick up your copy of this special Advent devotional magazine from your child's classroom. It's not too late to dig in. It's got engaging activities and special discussion topics for each week of Advent designed to draw families closer to God and closer to each other while focusing on the true meaning of the season. It's our gift to you. Copies will still be available upon request if you aren't in person with us this week. Y'all may be seated as we light the second Advent candle. In week two of our Advent celebration, we light the candle that represents peace. Isaiah 9, 6 reads, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. 
and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Jesus brought peace in the most unexpected way when he arrived. The Jews, particularly the Zealots, wanted a rebellion. They wanted their savior to overturn the oppressive rule of the Romans and bring about peace in a violent, mighty, grandiose way. But God had something different, something better in mind with his entire plan of his son's life, death, and resurrection. Peace comes to us in a few different ways through Jesus. First, he gives us inner peace because of his sacrifice on the cross. Second, we can have peace with others. We can put our, aside our differences, especially with other believers, because we belong to the same family. Third, we can have an all-encompassing, all-encompassing shalom, which is the Hebrew word for peace. In English, the word peace just tends to mean something like the lack of war or conflict. And while the biblical concept of shalom also includes this sort of peace, it's only a part of what God promised to his people in the days before the first coming of Jesus. Shalom is a deeper peace that is also complete wholeness and well-being. Shalom is the ideal for our individual lives and for that of God's creation at large. It's a return to God's original creation before it was marred by humanity's sin. Think about that and just marvel in it. Today, ask the Lord to fill you with his perfect peace as you navigate a broken world, knowing that he who has promised is faithful. Remember a time when you experienced God's peace in your life. Maybe share that story with a friend to encourage them. You never know who might really need it. Father God, would you please show us what it means to find true rest in you. Let there be peace, peace to every nation. Let there be hope for all the world to see. Let there be love and joy to all the children. Let there be peace on earth for you.
we have an opportunity now to step into our time of communion today. And we have stations in the front and in the back. We have a gluten-free option over there, white wafers for those of you that might need that. But during this next section of a song, come forward and get your emblems and go back to your seat and hold on to them today. And we will take communion together as a, as a body unified together. So if you would just take a moment during the song to get your heart ready and get your emblems ready and we'll take communion together. We learned this song last week and we want y'all to be able to worship along with us again. Here's a, let's do it. chapter 17 verse 3 says and this is eternal life that you know God and the one Jesus Christ who he sent often we think of eternal life as being life forever after this life but eternal life according to the scripture according to what God says eternal life is actually knowing and having a relationship with God being connected with him forever and so now we we do this in unity together. We take the bread, which on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread at a meal and he gave it a new significance, a new meaning. He said that this bread will be uh, symbolized now my body that will be given for you. And at that same meal, he took fruit of the vine and the juice, the wine, and he took it and he poured it into a cup and he passed it around to his disciples and said, this now symbolizes my blood that will be shed for you. He does this for us. Take this and drink it together. Lord, we celebrate eternity even now because we know that it's not about a, a time period, but it's about a relationship. It's about being connected with you and the son that you sent to die for us. Thank you that we celebrate that first advent this time of the year and that it reminds us of just how important it is and how much you want to connect with us. Thank you for loving us so well. In Jesus' name, amen.
we're going to do a new song now. I'm actually really grateful to Adam who uh, suggested we do this song this week. Um, I had never heard it before, but y'all, this is one of the most, I don't know, worship, it just really hit me this week. And I don't know if y'all have ever had a, an experience like that when a song just hits you. Um, but I just, I pray that over our room today that, that we will just get lost in this next moment of worship because Jesus in every stage of his life, death, and resurrec rex resurrection is so incredibly worthy of all of our praise. as we sing it one more time. today to you. Let them be a sweet, sweet aroma. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, 
Amen, amen. God, you are worthy of everything that we can give and more. You are the King of kings, you are the Lord of lords, you are the God of all, and you deserve everything that we can offer. We thank you for being a God of grace and a God of mercy and a God of love. We thank you for being a God that we can call Father. Meet us here, Lord, uh, as we break open your word and as we are, are brought into a challenge of walking with you, renew us, restore us, remind us of who you've made us to be. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. Y'all have a seat. Well, last week we had a, a beautiful moment of baptism. Alex Wendell was baptized. Y'all, y'all take a look. It's my honor and privilege to baptize you, Alex. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I baptize you, Alex, Sander. Thomas Baron Wendell, you are buried with Christ and risen in the newness of life. There is nothing better than watching new life happen in our midst. Men, women, and children coming home to our Father. Journey, I, I just want to let you know there's... Uh, There is a beauty of being a part of family with you. Watching uh, us live together, struggle together, move into the city with love and grace. Uh, there's nothing like it. Um, I was just talking this last week with someone uh, about Kristen and I are finishing up our 26th year of marriage. Uh, our, our 27th anniversary is going to be in like two weeks, and uh, full-time ministry started with us two weeks later. But what that means for me is half of that time has been with you. And um, what an incredible journey. No pun intended. As a part of that, uh, one of the things that I am so honored and proud about with us as a, as a church family is how we give uh, to each other and to the world. And I'm not just talking about money, but I am talking about money. Um, we are a, a people, I had a conversation with our staff this last week that I don't remember any time that we've ever raised our hand and said, hey, we need something. And we didn't, we didn't do it. And... The way that we partner outside of these walls with China Spring Cares, um, with Young Life, with Journey to the Streets, with Nexus, like, and then the things that we, we do right here in our midst. It's just a beautiful thing. And the last, last week, Jeff Brabrand helped us kind of point toward taking care of some of those things. And so I want to remind you and point you uh, again and let you know if you weren't here last week, what's, what's going on. Uh, we passed and moved into the 2024 budget uh, last week. It's going to be about $46,000 a month uh, to take care of all of those things. And what it actually means is about $1,000 a month goes toward both internal and external ministries. Um, our dream is much bigger than that. And in order for us to, to get there, what we're doing is we are raising our entire year's worth of ministry budgeting and funding this month. Uh, and so there on the wall over there, can we raise the, the lights? On the wall on that side, there are... Uh, there were 180 envelopes 
uh, on the wall that totals $20,000. And when you add that $20,000 plus our $1,000 a month, that puts us at $32,000 of ministry funding for the year. And look at what it takes care of. Guys, it, it takes care of us taking care of the hurting and the poor in our city. It takes care of our local outreach and, like, caring for people that don't ever walk through these doors and loving them well. It takes care of our Journey Kids ministry, our bridge, our student ministry. It goes into marketing. It does our, like, everything that we, that we do, it moves into those, those things. And so uh, what our goal is, is to get beyond uh, just the bare minimum. Our goal is to dream to make these things happen in, in uh, terrific power. I, I was losing my words for a second. If we fund this at $20,000, uh, our impact in the city will be known and felt. Uh, quite honestly, this, this past year, because of the year that we had to, to walk through, we funded it at about $5,000, uh, and we're changing that. So, last week we had $20,000 on the wall. Uh, by the time second service was over, I went and counted, and $10,000 of it uh, was gone in the envelopes, which was really Amazing. So one word of coaching. If you took an envelope, uh, you have two options. You can put the money or the, the cash or a check in the envelope and put it in the drop box in the back, or you can scan the QR code, and it'll take you straight to uh, our church center app, and you can tithe straight from there. Um, if you have not taken an envelope, Here's my challenge. Take one today. There are entry, easy level, $25 at the top. It moves to $50, $100, $200, and then at the very bottom, there's some question marks. You get to do your own thing. Uh, join us in extending the ministry and mission of Jesus, both inside these walls and out side these walls. Let's pray. God, do your thing. You are such an amazing God. You care for us. You change us. You renew us. But Father, you are a God that runs after the one who doesn't know. And I pray, Father, that you continue to make us a people that pursues your kids that uh, just are not home yet. Make us a people that are joyfully joining you and running down the road to welcome them in. Father, do more than what we could ask or imagine with this, uh, with this ministry campaign. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. Now, if you have not already, if you were fifth and sixth grade, the bridge, y'all get out of here. How are we doing? It is December. It is week two of Advent. We are in the middle of it. Have you completed your shopping yet? I know the type A people are laughing. He's like, I did that Thanksgiving week. Uh, but some of you are procrastinators, and I understand you, and I need some help as well. Last week, Landon started a new series that we're in for the series of Advent called The Best Gift Ever, where we're taking a four-week period to look at the Advent uh, season through the lens of the Sermon on the Mount, which is Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And so last week, we talked about hope, and this week, we're talking about peace. One of my favorite things about the end of the year is I'm that kind of person that loves seeing people's like top 10 list, top 10 movies I saw, top 10 books I read, top 10 TV shows. I, I'm a sucker for it. And the New York Times posted it this week. I was like, oh, I want to see what everyone's top 10 list is. One of my top five books 
uh, that I read this year was called Stolen Focus, Why You Can't Pay Attention and How to Think Deeply Again. It was a fascinating read, top five for me. And here's a quote from that book that I want to share with you this morning. He talks a lot about how we've been a distracted people and we can't think deeply. And so in one of his chapters, he talks about negativity bias. And this is what he says. On average, we will stare at something negative and outrageous for a lot longer than we will stare at something positive and calm. Some of you are like, uh, duh. And this is uh, what they call negativity bias. Uh, literally on the way to my parents' house for Thanksgiving, I'm on the highway trying to pray my way through uh, downtown Houston, and all of a sudden I see a bunch of red lights, and I'm like, oh, but then I'm like, oh, somebody's life might be endangered, so I shouldn't be upset, and finally we get past it, and on, not even on the highway, on the feeder, there was like a little fender bender, and that's why the traffic is like, we are attracted to the negativity. We just have to look. We can't just keep going. Uh, but we see this happening best online. And uh, so I'm going to pull up some of your screenshots. No, I'm not. <laughs> that would be fun, though. That would be fun, though. Uh, but we really see negativity bias the best when it comes to online and social media. On YouTube, if you want to get picked up by the algorithm, they found that the best words to put in your title are words such as hates, obliterates, slams, and destroys. And when we go over to Twitter, or what they now call X, whatever you want to call it, a study by NYU found that for every word of moral outrage you add to a tweet, your retweet, wait, retweet rate will go up by 20% on average, and the words that will increase your retweet rate, wow, that is a tongue twister. Words that will increase your retweet rate most are attack, bad, and blame. And the moment you've all been waiting for, Facebook. Okay, Pew Research found that if you fill your Facebook post with, quote, indignant disagreement, you'll double your likes and shares. Journey, I have a new social media strategy for our church. <laughs> indignant <laughs> disagreement this week. That's what I want you to do. No. Uh, but this is just the life that we live. Like, we love the drama. We love the negativity. And why do I bring this up? Uh, at the end of his chapter, he has a line that is just like, oh, I wish I could be this brilliant. And here's how he sums it up in one sentence. If it's more enraging, it's more engaging. Ooh. And here's what I want to start with this morning. Peace for many of us, seems like a foreign word. Like, that's not an English word. I don't understand what that means. That's not a word that we understand and know and experience in our daily life. Peace, that's an imaginary word. That's not real. Do the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Brilliance, brilliantly said, true peace is not merely the absence of tension. It is the presence of justice. He had a deep understanding of the scriptures. And peace in the Bible, shalom, means completeness or wholeness in every area of life, including one's relationship with God, others, and nation. And here's just a few quick examples in the Bible to understand this word. Job says his tents are in a state of shalom because he counted his flock and no animals were missing. Shalom is also used as a verb. Solomon brings shalom to the unfinished temple when it is finally complete. You can even shalom human relationships. In the book of Proverbs, to reconcile and heal a broken relationship is to bring shalom. When rival kingdoms make shalom in the Bible, it doesn't mean they just stop fighting. It also means they start working together for the benefit of each other. This is why peace takes so much work. Because it's not just a lack of fighting. It is to make whole and to bring what is incomplete to completeness. And I just want to pause and just acknowledge in a room this size that peace uh, might be hard for us to experience, especially with the year that you might have had. 
Uh, I know some of your lives. I don't know all of your lives, but I could understand. At the end of the year, when we look back on 2023, you're like, peace is the last word that I would use to describe my life. It was chaotic. It was full of loss. It was full of drama. It was full of heartbreak. How do we dare on this second Sunday of Advent, Advent celebrate peace? Um, I want to take a moment to just consider the Christmas story through the lens of Mary. How can we find peace in the midst of chaos? Uh, some of you, most of you probably know this, but my wife, Becca, is pregnant. We're, we're expected to have our baby in February. And what that means is this Advent season, this Christmas season, is hitting me a lot differently. And uh, thinking about peace and the Christmas story and preaching, I, I can't help but to think of Becca. She's pregnant. Uh, we are patiently waiting, just like Israel has been patiently waiting for their Savior. Not that our son is a Savior, but uh, you understand what I'm trying to say. And so I, I just want to take a few moments to reflect on Mary. Think about it. Uh, we have a teenage girl. Most scholars believe that Mary was between the ages of 13 and 15 years old when she becomes pregnant, when she's engaged to Joseph. So we have a teenage girl from a poor family engaged to a man, and she gets pregnant. And could you imagine, just stop, could you imagine the fear, the worry that overwhelms her at this moment? What will her parents think? What will Joseph think? Will Joseph still want to be married to her? Will her parents kick her out of the house? Will Joseph leave her? Who will help her raise this baby? Who's going to put bread and food on the table? And not only that, but what are my friends going to think? No one's going to want anything to do with me because of my sin that people are going to just think about. And I'm going to be alone trying to raise this baby. Um. Fast forward to her birth. She is not in a sterile and clean medical building, nor in the comfort of her home, but in a dirty barn. She isn't stranded with family and friends, but instead stranded by camels, horses, and pigs. Everything around her is chaotic. Everything around her is not the environment of peace. And despite all of this, another layer to the chaos is what's going on in the political sector. It is not a re-election year that brings out the crazy in people. It is, there is uh, not a new policy that divides the people in two. There is a tyrannical, power-hungry, determined man who is ruling in such a way as to protect what he has by destroying others. And this is the society that her baby boy is going to be born into. And Herod, the ruler at the time, when he hears about the birth of Jesus, these are the words that we read in Matthew 2. He was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and younger. Despite all the chaos, despite every reason to not have peace, here's the beauty of what we celebrate in Advent. All the time. Within her was the Prince of Peace. How beautiful is that? And us, like Mary, when there is chaos, when we are overwhelmed, when it feels like peace is nothing but far away, it is actually so close and near. How? Because in Ephesians 2, Paul says, for he himself is our peace. And this is the radical message that we celebrate on this second Sunday of Advent. That when things are at their worst, when the unexpected happens to you, when things go unplanned, when people are attacking you and trying to bring you down, peace is within you. John 14 says, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. The same spirit that descended upon Jesus in the baptismal waters is the same spirit residing in you. And I can't, 
Look, there's no explanation for some of her pain and suffering and loss, but here's the good news of the gospel that Christians believe. is not that it doesn't happen, but that we have someone with us in the middle of it. And it's Jesus, the Prince of Peace, with us through it all. So now that we know what peace is, it is completeness and wholeness, and we know that it doesn't matter the chaos and circumstances of our life, we still have peace and celebrate peace. Let's, let's turn to a better question. How do we give this peace to others? Once we've received the Holy Spirit, once we've received this gift of peace, how do we then give it to others? Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. We're going to be in chapter 6 of the Gospel of Matthew. So as you're turning there, this is the second chapter of the Sermon on the Mount, and uh, he is going to come down hard on people's motivations. And let's see what Jesus says, chapter 6, verse 1. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received the reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Here's a question I don't want you to answer out loud. I really, this is an internal question. You think about this. Why do you do what you do? Why do you do what you do? And if you're honest, do you identify with the criticism that Jesus has? Do you do the things you do to be seen by others? And not just to be seen by them, but to be honored by them. That Greek word honor is the same word for glory, to be for others to glory in you. Is that why you do the things that you do? Jesus gives a strong warning because he knows it's possible to do the right things with the wrong motive. I'm sure you have never experienced that before because you are all perfect people, but I have struggled with this before for doing the right thing with the wrong motive and heart. Uh, It's been a while since I've taken a psychology class, but I know some of the basics, and there are different kinds of motivation. Uh, There's a lot to this, but big picture, there are two different types of motivation, intrinsic motivation and extrinsic motivation, okay? So let's be smart. So intrinsic is from within. So you are a person that is motivated by internal uh, mechanisms, like you want to do a good job. You want to do the right thing. There's these internal mechanisms that make you motivated. But some of you are motivated by extrinsic motivation from outside for the pay raise, for the recognition, for the job title, whatever it may be that you are doing the things for that you get rewarded by. Now, often uh, both our intrinsic and extrinsic motivation is to be seen and honored by others. Why? Because we are obsessed with the public. We are obsessed with followers and likes and influencers and celebrities, and we are jealous when others get attention that we think we deserve, when others get the recognition that we want the recognition. And some of us post on social media, I would never know, but some of us post on social media and immediately refresh to see how many likes we've gotten in the past five seconds. You know, we just are obsessed with the public and obsessed with being honored and rewarded and recognized. And some stern words, the very first sentence of chapter six, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. In chapter six, he spends the whole chapter talking about giving, praying, and fasting. And all of them can be you can do the right thing with the wrong motive. You can give, you can pray, and you can fast the right ways, but with the wrong intention. And Jesus warns about the desire to be seen by others. And so what is his solution? What is he wanting you to do instead? Verses three and four. But when you give to the needy, 
Do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. When I was studying this week, th- that word popped up, secret. That word can also me- mean private or hidden. And I want to talk a few, for a few moments, I think it's really important, about the secret place. And primarily, I'm preaching to myself, and if you're in the room, uh, congrats, I'm, you also get to hear what I'm about to say to myself. Uh, primarily, this is for someone like me who finds themselves 35 and younger, or if you have changed into a new season of life, uh, I want to talk to you this morning. So teenagers through 35 and those that are going through a new season, I want to talk about the secret place. When we look at the life of Jesus, it's remarkable how he embraced and prioritized the secret place. He did not begin his formal ministry until he was 30 years old. Think about that. For 30 years, he was in the secret, private place, not in the public, just doing his life and waited 30 years. And not only that, but he was content to live in the middle of nowhere, far from where everything was happening, where you wanted to know people so that you could get very far in life. He did not have those relationships. And when he does begin his ministry, right after he's baptized, he receives the Holy Spirit. And where does he go? the wilderness, by himself, to be with his father in the secret place. And then throughout his three years of ministry, he continually withdrew to quiet places to pray and spend time with the father. And here's what we learn from the life of Jesus. The secret place is where we develop and mature. The place where it is just you and the father a place where you are hidden and not in the public to be seen and honored by others, but it's just you and the Father. It was the secret place that formed and developed him into who he was. It was the secret place where he built intimacy and relationship with his Father. And when the demands of his life grew, so did his desire to withdraw to the secret place. Yet many of us have this completely backwards. We rush through the secret place We want to bypass the secret place and get to the public sphere and the public space so we can do the important work. And yet, when we do this, I want to give you a warning. When you rush through the secret place or try to skip the secret place to get to the public place, here's what happens. You are immature and insecure so that when the demands of your life increase, so does your pride. And listen, for some of you, it is not your time. And I say this with so much love, and I'm saying this to myself. The place that you need to be is in the secret place. You do not need to be in the public place. It is his kindness. He hasn't given you what you wanted, has not given you the platform, has not given you the audience, has not given you the job title that you think you have at this age of your life. Do you know what's better than the Lord giving you what you think you want, not giving it to you when you're not ready, not giving it to you when you're immature and insecure because you have not spent sufficient time in the secret place. I want to talk about competency and character. Stay with me if you're 35 and younger or in a new season of life. I think this is vitally important. So competency, people that are just naturally gifted, that they're just good at things, uh, and they have gifting and talents. And what happens with these people in the workplace is it's obvious to bosses and everyone that they perform, they are really good at what they do, and so they get promoted quickly. And here's the thing is in, in the business world, people celebrate competency because there are measurables that you perform, and we want to keep you here, and we want to let you do what you're really good at. But here's the problem when your competency is greater than your character. Yes, you get promoted. Yes, you get more responsibility. Yes, people honor you and look up to you, but you do not have the character to sustain your life. And what's up happening is you not only hurt yourself, but you hurt everyone around you. God's design is for your character to outpace your competency. 
Because here's what happens. If you are an underperformer, if you are not very talented, if you cannot keep up with those people that seem to just have it so easy, here's what happens. You, sin, you tend to depend on the Lord more than other people in your life. And when your character is greater than your competency, God uses you to bring blessing to him and to yourself and to everyone around you. What do you learn in the secret place? I am loved by my father. I am blessed by my father. I am chosen by my father. The father approves of me. I have all that I need in the father. And when you spend time in the secret place, when you learn this, we're talking about peace. Listen, this is where true peace is found. This is where you are made whole in the presence of your father by yourself. This is how you are complete and not lacking so that you don't go to the public place seeking for other people to make you whole, for your job title to make you complete, for peace to be given to you by other people because you're insecure and immature. The secret place is where we learn that everything we need is from the father. And this is where internal peace comes from and where you learn that you are secure, you are confident, you are mature, and now that you've received all this in the secret place, Jesus will bless you and send you to the public place to be a blessing to others because you can now not demand peace from them, but you can give peace to other people. And this is our intrinsic motivation, that we desire to be in the secret place with our Father, to be mature and developed and completed and to receive peace from him alone so we can then hand that off to other people. So let's turn a corner and talk about rewarding and external motivators. What was the religious people's motivation? Matthew 6, 2 says, So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. They did the right thing with the wrong motive. They wanted the glory. They wanted the praise. They wanted the honor. And here's what's terrifying about this. If the reward that you seek is the praise of others, you will get it. And that's terrifying. And, uh, and here's the problem with this. If you seek to be rewarded by the praise of others, listen, you will settle for a lesser reward than what is available to you. It breaks my heart and it's so sad to see insecure, immature followers of Jesus settle for the praise, recognition, and awards from other people. Why? Why does this happen? Because you lack peace. You lack maturity. And so what happens in your brokenness is you seek to fill it in the wrong places in a desperate need of internal peace. And Jesus tells them that if you do the right thing with the wrong motive, here's what's terrifying. They have received their reward in full. What else is on the table? Because I do not want you, I do not want myself to settle for the little reward of the recognition and honor from others when there's another option available. What is the other option available? Jesus in chapter six talks about giving, praying, and fasting. And every single one of them, he ends with this sentence. And it's, it, it captured my heart. And this is the vision of our life right here. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And your father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. I'm going to call the band back up and we're going to end. Listen, I, I understand that there's a line that I'm about to dance on right now. And some of you might be itching and you're like, whoa, is he really saying that we work for a reward from God? Does that mean that we earn things from the Lord? Here's what I'm not saying. Grace is free. Salvation is free. But there seems to be in the scriptures the idea that God will reward people. That he knows what we do and what we don't do and will give accordingly. 
and this is a whole nother sermon and I don't have time for it, but here's just what I want to do. I, here's the motivation. Internally, a true follower of Jesus, here's how we operate. Internally, we are grateful for the free gift of salvation that Jesus has given us. And therefore, we run to the secret place to grow and mature. And our intention is to give this to other people. But at the same time, I can't not share that there is a reward for some of us. And this is why we seek to be peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. That you are a son, you are a daughter, and you are blessed. Why? Because you are peacemakers. And here's just what I want to end with. I want to read scriptures over you because the idea of your father rewarding you is all throughout the scriptures. And I want to stir your heart and motivate you to walk out of these doors ready to be a peacemaker. And so you can close your eyes, you can stand, you can respond however you want to, but after I read these scriptures, let us celebrate and sing and pray for reward that the Father will give us. Colossians 3, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Hebrews 11, and without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Galatians 6, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Revelation 22, look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and last, the beginning and the end. James chapter one, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Ephesians six, serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whatever they, whichever they are slave or free. Matthew 25, and this is, this is what you need to memorize. This is what gets me up out of bed in the morning. This is what keeps me here. This is why I'm still in ministry. This is what keeps me on the straight and narrow in my prayer. It is for you as well. Matthew 25. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. In this last sentence, Come and enter the joy of your master. Come, enter the joy of your master. Do you know what your father has waiting for you? Rewards. For those who earnestly seek him. For those that desire him in the secret place. And after spending sufficient time in the secret place where they are mature and not lacking in anything and they have peace and they leave the secret place into the public place and they become a conduit of God's blessing and peace to the whole world and they are ready for the reward that awaits for them. This is why we live. Stand, let us sing in joy and gratitude of our good Father who rewards those. Sing with us.
Thank you so much for joining us in worship this morning. Um, I hope that you received a little bit of peace this morning. Uh, before I ascend into Miss you just want to continue to remind you about the envelopes on the wall. Uh, I can tell you story about, story after about students' lives being transformed. Because uh, here's, I heard this at a fundraiser, and it made me die laughing, but it's so true. Uh, the person at the fundraiser said, salvation is free, but ministry costs money. And uh, that's so true. What we have to offer is for free, but in order to do that work, it takes a little money. And so there's no better way for you to, like this money doesn't go to the building. It doesn't go to our salaries. This money goes towards blessing people and doing ministry with them. And so if that makes you feel better, then run over there, don't walk, okay? Take five. As you go, I hope that in the, <laughs> in the midst of chaos, uh, in the midst of the unexpected and unplanned like Mary, that you would know that you inside of you has the Prince of Peace. May we be a people that desperately seek to be in the secret place, to be seen and honored by our Father and not other people. So that way we can go into the world as a blessing and hand off peace to others freely. As we go, let's walk together and make a difference.